By early summer 1945, the Japanese fully realized that they were beaten. Why did they nonetheless fight on? As Ascombe wrote, it was the insistence of unconditional surrender that was the root of all evil. That math formula was coined by Roosevelt at the Casablanca Conference and with Churchill's enthusiast concurrence, it became the Allied Shibboleth. After prolonging the war in Europe, it did its works in the Pacific. At the Potsdam Conference in July 1945, Truman issued a proclamation to the Japanese, threatening them with the utter devastation of their homeland unless they surrendered unconditionally. Among the Allied terms, to which there are no alternatives, was that there be eliminated for all time the authority and influence of those who have deceived and misled the people of Japan into embarking on world context seek. Stern justice, the proclamation word, would be met out to all war criminals. To the Japanese, this meant that the emperor, regarded by them to be divine, the direct descendant of the goddess of the sun, would certainly be dethroned and probably put on trial as a war criminal and hanged, perhaps in front of his palace. It was not, in fact, the United States' intention to dethrone or punish the emperor. But this implicit modification of unconditional surrender was never communicated to the Japanese. In the end, after Nagasaki, Washington acceded to the Japanese desire to keep the dynasty and even to retain Hirohito as emperor. Four months before, Truman had been pressed to clarify the United States position by many high officials within the administration and outside of it as well. In May 1945, the president's request, Herbert Hoover prepared a memorandum stressing the urgent need to end the war as soon as possible. The Japanese should be informed that we would in no way interfere with the emperor or the chosen form of government. He even raised the possibility that, as part of the terms, Japan might be allowed to hold on to Formosa, Taiwan and Korea. After a meeting with Truman, Hoover dined with Taft and other Republican leaders and outlined his proposals. Establishment writers on World War II often liked to deal in lurid speculations. For instance, if the United States had not entered the war, then Hitler would have conquered the world. As at undervaluation of the Red Army, it would appear, moreover, it was any Japan that was trying to conquer the world and killed untold millions. Now, applying conjectural history in this case, assume that the Pacific War had ended in the way wars customarily do through negotiation of the terms of surrender, and assume the worst that the Japanese had adamantly insisted on preserving part of the Euro Empire, say Korean, Formosa, even Manchuria. In that event, it is quite possible that Japan would have been in a position to prevent the communists from coming to power in China, and that could have meant that the 30 or 40 million deaths now attributed to the Maoist regime would not have occurred. But even remaining within the limits of the feasible diplomacy in 1945, it is clear that Truman in no way exhausted the possibilities of ending the war without recourse to the atomic bomb. The Japanese were not informed that there would be the victims of by far the most lethal weapon ever invented, one with more than 2,000 times the blast power of the British Grand Slam, which is the largest bomb ever yet used in the history of warfare, as Truman boasted in his announcement of the Hiroshima attack. Nor were they told that the Soviet Union was set to declare war on Japan, and even that shocked some in Tokyo more than the bombings. Pleased by some of the scientists involved in the project to demonstrate the power of the bomb in some inhabited or evacuated area were rebuffed. All that mattered was to formally preserve the unconditional surrender formula and save the servicemen's lives that might have been lost in the effort to enforce it. Yes, 
As Major General G. F. C. Fuller, one of the century's great military historians, wrote in connection with the atomic bombings, quote, For to save life is laudable, it in no way justifies the employment of means which run counter to every precept of humanity and the customs of war. Should it do so, then, on the pretext of shortening a war and of saving lives, every imaginable atrocity can be justified." Unquote. Isn't this obviously true? And isn't this the reason that rational and humane men over generations developed rules of warfare in the first place? While the mass media parroted the government line in praising the atomic incinerations, prominent conservatives denounced them as unspeakable war crimes. Felix Morley, a constitutional scholar and one of the founders of human events, drew attention to the horror of our Hiroshima, including the thousands of children trapped in the 33 schools that were destroyed. He called on his compatriots to atone for what had been done in the your name, and proposed that groups of Americans be sent to Hiroshima as Germans were sent to witness what had been done in the Nazi camps. The Polish priest, Father James Gillis, editor of The Catholic World, and another stalwart of the old right, castigated the bombings as the most powerful blow ever delivered against Christian civilization and the moral law. David Lawrence, conservative owner of United States News and World Report, continued to denounce them for years. The distinguished conservative philosopher Richard Weaver was revolted by, quote, the spectacle of young boys fresh out of Kansas and Texas turning non-military Dresden into a holocaust, pulverizing ancient shrines like Monte Cassino and Nuremberg, and bringing atomic annihilation to Hiroshima and Nagasaki." Unquote. We were considered such atrocities as deeply inimical to the foundations on which civilization is built. Today, self stale conservatives slander as anti-American anyone who is in the least troubled by Truman's massacre and so many tens of thousands of Japanese innocents from the air. This shows as well as anything the difference between today's conservatives and those who once deserved the name. Leo Slither was the world-renowned physicist who drafted the original letter to Roosevelt that Einstein signed instigating the Manhattan Project. In 1960, shortly before his death, Slither slated another obvious truth. If the Germans had dropped atomic bombs on cities instead of us, we would have defined the dropping of atomic bombs on cities as a war crime and we would have sentenced the Germans who were guilty of this crime to death at Nuremberg and hanged them. The destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a war crime worse than that Japanese generals were executed for in Tokyo and Manila. If Harry Truman was not a war criminal, then no one ever was.